Hello, I'd like to welcome you to our study this evening. We are going to be looking at the one Godhead and how we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet each of these is part of this one Spirit we call the Godhead. And so that is what we're going to be looking at for this lesson. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to make sure you have your Bible out uh, to read along with the scriptures because we want to make sure that we are looking to the Word of God for all of our answers. And so I encourage you to have your Bible handy. Well, the oneness of the Godhead, or the Trinity, uh, sometimes we refer to it, is one that is probably one of the more difficult concepts for us to grasp. And so this is as good a study as any. And as we say, uh, you know, as I said, we want to look to the, any Bible topic. We want to make sure that we are looking to the Bible for our answers, for the Word of God. When we go to the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, we read this passage that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now this primary message of the passage is that God alone is that, you know, God. He, he alone is the Lord. Only to him is ascribed the powers and attributes of God. The name God or Jehovah, it does not belong to any other. It only belongs to to God or to Elohim, as is the existence of that name is attributed to. Uh, if you look to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, the text it simply says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Even when we go back to Genesis chapter 1, if you would look there, we find this word for God, Elohim. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, Elohim here, according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it defines it as being God's in the ordinary sense, but specifically used uh, in the plural, uh, thus especially with an article, is of the supreme God, uh, of, of the you know, God, great, very great, uh, judges or mighty. And so what we learn from Deuteronomy 6.4 is that there is no other God, uh, Elohim, as there are, as we read in the Bible. There are not gods or, or there are no gods other than God. And while people may call something a God, you know, we may refer to things as God, we may attribute something as being God, they simply just are not gods. There, there is no other that can be compared to the God of the Bible that we read of, as we read of Elohim or, or Jehovah. We need to understand that there is only one God. When we look to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, uh, there is embedded in this passage a, a beautiful truth that's ignored by some. It's opposed by others. And we see that the idea of monotheism, or that being of one God, is quite obvious in this passage of Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. The Israelites understood this. And there is, there was, and always will be only one true God. Now, this passage condemns and denies every form of theism and deism and all philosophical deductions regarding God, which tend to reduce him to, you know, just another God among many. Jehovah, or, or God, although the absolute one, it's not an abstract notion, but, but he is absolutely living God, as he made himself known in the past through his deeds for Israel, uh, the purpose of bringing salvation to the whole world. When we look to the Old Testament, it is case by case by case of study that shows that God alone is God. Look with me to Mark 12 and verse 29. Now, in Mark 12 and verse 29, after Jesus was asked, you know, which of this, which of this is the first commandment of all? When we look to Mark 12 and verse 29, he answered, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
And Jesus himself is quoting from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And of the oneness of God is set forth in the Old Testament. He's a compound unit. He is like the oneness of the people. When we refer to, you know, people of the United States, you know, obviously we're individuals, but we refer to the people. And so there's a oneness. There's a oneness in marriage. We have a husband and wife, but it's one marriage. And there are no arguments here when we look to, you know, the text of our Bible that argue against the concept of the Trinity. Now, Paul, he would also write that there is one body and one spirit. When we look to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, he says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There is one body, it refers to the spiritual body of Christ, the church. One spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, it directs the one body through the delivered word. And in one Lord, referring to Jesus, who having been crucified, buried, resurrected, and exalted to the right hand of God, has all authority over heaven and earth. Matthew 28, verses 18. Uh, there is no other that is Lord. And, and understanding that Jesus is also God, come to the earth in the form of man, as we read in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and in verse 14, just actually read John 1, 1 through 14. We, we only have one faith, believing that Jesus is Lord, who will save us which leads us to obedience in the faith and of the one baptism. And then Paul says there is one God. The seventh of these ones of unity is God himself. He is the creator, the benefactor, and preserver of all things. And so we need to understand the unity of the Godhead. And if there was no other passage that we read in our Bible, other than Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, on this subject, this one would be enough to show that tritheism, or the belief that there are three separate gods, is a false idea. There, there is but one infinite and perfect spirit, and that being deity, God himself. Now, infinity and absolute perfection are possible only to the one being, and that being God. There is, it's not more than one. It's not possible. Uh, you know, to, it, it is possible only to one for there to be God. The definition of unity is the divine nature is undivided and indivisible. The members of the Godhead are indistinguishable but are not separable. We have used some phrases here. Let us look at a little closer at them. The divine nature is undivided. It is just one essence or one spirit being. In John chapter 4 and verse 24, uh, John, uh, Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And Jesus says to her, God is spirit. As such, not only is it undivided, it cannot be divided. It's indivisible. The Godhead the Spirit of God is one and only one. There is just one God, one Spirit God. Um, our definition here of unity, I'd also like to give thanks to uh, Brother Chuck Horner for, for uh, his contribution as, as uh, some of his material I, I studied for this, and uh, Brian Kenyon with the Florida School of Preaching. So appreciate some of the contributing works as we, uh, we go through this lesson. We want to make sure we give credit where credit is due. And so this this unity, this, this, this you know, God, he's distinguishable, but he's not separable. When we look to the Godhead, uh, diagram here again, thanks to Brother Chuck Warner for these diagrams. Um, we look at this, this represents what's called tritheism. And that's the belief that there are some who hold that, that there are three separate gods. That there is the Father that is God, there is the Son that is God, and there is the Holy Spirit that is God. And that they're three separate individuals. Well, this is not exactly correct. This is an incorrect view that they are three separate gods. 
They are three separate individuals, which we'll look at more in a moment, but they're not three separate gods. There are some that teach that the Father is in heaven, that the Son now is in heaven, having had been on earth at one time, but as a separate being, and then that there is a third being, and that being the Holy Spirit, who is on earth today. Now, this false view makes for three separate entities, three separate gods. That is polytheism, the belief in more than one God. And when we look to the Bible, the Bible never teaches us polytheism. Right back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Uh, and I want to take a moment for us here when we, we look to this to consider the idea of Jesus at the right hand of God. Be, because we do read that. If you look to Matthew 26 and verse 64. Matthew 26 and verse 64. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will not see the Son of Man, or I'm sorry, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And so this is when Jesus was brought before the high priest and they were questioning him. The question posed to Jesus was whether or not he was the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus' answer was very clear. He was the divine Messiah. His added reply of sitting at the right hand and coming on the clouds refers to his second coming. When, it, when he would appear, not as a man as he was now, but with his true dignity and in judgment. Let us also look to Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, in verse 55 through 56, Here we read, uh, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then, let me go back here, sorry, starting with verse 55. But he, and this is uh, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, Stephen here is directed by the Holy Spirit in what to say. And as he looked into the heaven, he saw the glory of God, which was a vision of God and his glory. It, it was fitting indeed that God should have given to, the, to this first Christian martyr, this faithful Christian, such a glorious vision of eternal realities. And sitting at the right hand of God is the usual attitude ascribed to our Lord in token to his victorious rest and waiting for the day of judgment. And one of sovereignty and glory, that, that right hand. But here he is seen standing, not sitting, as he's, as, as he's rising up to welcome his faithful, faithful martyr and to place on his head that crown of life. Stephen describes just what Jesus said in Matthew 26 and verse 64, evidenced by the fact that no other save Jesus himself, ever you know, described, described him as the Son of Man when we read the New Testament. This term is taken from the Old Testament passages. It refers to the Messiah and to his role in redemption. Jesus' humanity mattered. Jesus was conceived by the Spirit and he was full of the Spirit of God, but he was birthed by Mary and he was born as a man. His ability to sympathize in all of our weaknesses, as we read in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, and, and not sin, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it means that he was and is the only one who could redeem us. And by using the term son of man, many would recognize the implication that he was the Christ, deity himself. We look to Jesus and, and he was 100% man, Otherwise, he couldn't suffer with us. He couldn't sympathize with us. He could not be our high priest. Yet, he was also 100% deity. Look at Colossians 3 and verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Again, there is a parallelism here 
also to baptism, where we die to sin and we are then in Christ. If we have died to the world and to sin and then are in Christ, we then should be set on the things that are above, those things that are higher in importance than those below. Heavenly, spiritual things as opposed to carnal or fleshly things. The life of Christ is the elevation of our whole humanity into a divine realm of thought and of action. This, this figuratively expresses the union of Christ with God in the possession of divine power and authority and in peace, a further reason for seeking heavenly things. Well, now let us take a look at some of the different diagrams. Again, thank you to Brother Chuck Warner uh, and World Video Bible School for, the, for these uh, charts here, or these diagrams, uh, to help us understand the Godhead. Now, this first one, it represents the Godhead, and, and it's not too bad. Um, we see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, but they're, and, and, and they are all part of one Spirit, one God. Uh, the center one here is a little bit better. It shows the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're, they are overlapping each other, uh, and a full unity is shown in the center. But the last one here, the one closest to me, uh, it, this is the last one that is really best, where the internal parts are gone, and we see that there is one Spirit or one Deity. There's three personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they are all one Spirit. And, you know, I would like in, you know, in the past, I thought of uh, an egg. You, you, and as this is the way it was described to me. You have the shell, you have the white, you have the yolk. There are three distinguishable parts, but it's only one egg. Uh, my oldest daughter, uh, I was talking to her about this, and, and she said, oh, well, it's like mom. She's a daughter, and she's a, she's a mom, and she's a wife. And so there's three aspects of her, but it's one person. And I said, well, that's... That's a pretty good explanation too. And so when we look forward to, to the Bible, there we see some passages in the Bible where the personality of the Father is presented to us. And, and some passages we read of the Son, some passages speak of the Holy Spirit, and some passages we actually see all three or, or two of the three. And we see this combination like in Genesis 1 and verses 26 and 27. Uh, we also see Genesis 11, verse 7, or Genesis 22, verses 11 and 12, and it speaks of, you know, this, this you know, us and we, you know, let us make man in our image, let us go down. And so God speaks in the plural, us, and, and, and also we see the angel speaking, but then it was the Lord speaking. We see different personalities speaking, but only one spirit, one God. When we go back to Genesis 1 and verse 1, again, you know, it says that God created, Elohim, plural, but created singular. You know, in most languages, you have to have these agree in number, and yet we have a plural God with a singular created. And the fact that he's not plural as more than one God, but that there are more personalities, aspects of the one spirit. And this is understandably a hard thing to try and grasp. Um, in 2 Peter 3, verse 16, Peter says, in which are some things that are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. We see that Peter does not say that they are impossible to understand, but they are difficult. And we do see people who take these things and they'll just twist them around they make them more difficult than they need to be or, or than they are. And, and the problem is when you start twisting one scripture, you need to start twisting other scriptures to match that twisted scripture. And before you know it, well, as Paul told the Galatians, I, uh, you know, he marveled that they were turning away to another gospel, which is not another gospel. When we start twisting scriptures, it no longer becomes scripture and it no longer becomes gospel. So we must be careful and make sure we are understanding that. Uh, if you look to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 11 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. 
For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You know, the only way to know God is through his revelation by the Spirit, through his word. No wisdom of man can achieve this. It would be like trying to read the mind of somebody else. Uh, there, there is, there's not one uh, that, that, that no one knows. And we say that it's not that nobody knows, but that we know certain things. I, I can tell you things about myself, but you only know what I reveal to you, or maybe things you've witnessed. But there are things that are secret only to me, unless I tell them to you. And we see that the divine spirit, he knows. He knows because what has been revealed to him, because he is one spirit with God and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But we know only what is revealed to us by the Spirit or by the Word. Just as you know, we may know much about another person, but we're not in their mind. We can't know what they think and what, they, what they're doing at all times. That's not so with the Godhead. The, the real focus of these verses is the Holy Spirit making the gospel known to the apostles so that we may know the way of salvation. And that the Holy Spirit knows God, shows that he is God. And so when we read verses that speak of God and Jesus sitting at his right hand, we get the idea that these are separate beings, but they're not. There, there is only one God. Um, this is another illustration. Um, this one's very common. You can find, I remember when I was in preaching school, we actually uh, studied this and, and right in the inside cover, well, I guess it's actually not the inside cover, but here in, when we come into the New Testament, I actually drew this back in 2000 and. 12, I guess it was. And so when we look to this illustration, um, we're going to insert some scriptures in it to help us. In the very center, we have God, and we can put our verse of Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, we've already looked at this verse, but the principle is that there is and always will be only one God. Okay, so in this one circle in the corner, we, we're going to put F for the Father. Okay, so, so God the Father. Well, let's look then to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here we see Paul greet the church in Corinth in God our Father. The same relationship we saw in our model in the model prayer. Um, I think that might have been from a previous lesson, but from model prayer. Uh, but then Paul says, "In the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son." So we see that there is a distinction between the two. But yes, the Father is God. And we're going to take a, just a second here, and I apologize because these lessons are made from lessons that you know are given at the church on a regular basis. But in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 8, it talks about, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need before you ask him. In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so here we see our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy or sanctified is his name. And so... That is our model prayer. And God, you know, gave, Jesus gave us that. Not that we're going to recite it verbatim, but he's teaching us the manner in which to pray. And that's another lesson. And so we see that there is a distinction, though, between the Father and the Son. So what about the Son, then? 
but S up here in this other corner for son. And for this one, let us look to John chapter 1. Uh, we mentioned it a few moments ago, but let's go ahead and now read it. John chapter 1, in beginning in verse 1, and notice what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we see that the Son is God, the Word coming in the flesh, and that being Jesus the Christ. In Psalm 33, in verse 6, we read, By the Word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them, by his breath, by the breath of his mouth. Well, 1 John 1 1 also speaks of Jesus as the Word of life. Revelation 19, verse 13, speaking of Jesus and says, His name is called the Word of God. Some have mistranslated this verse to say that the Word was a little g God, not a capital V God, capital G God. And that's an incorrect translation. In Galatians chapter 4, and verses 8 and 9, Paul speaks of those who had practiced idolatry. And that these were no gods, little g's at all. And then he points out that all we know of God comes from God. So, not to listen to men. God tells us there is only one real God. If Jesus is not God, then he's no God at all. And we shouldn't even then be concerned with him. But he is God. And if Jesus was not God, when Thomas saw him and he touched him after his resurrection... Why do not those who translate John 1 verse 1 to say a little g God change the translation of Thomas who says my Lord and my God capital G John 20 verse 28 should not have Jesus corrected Thomas and said well, well wait a minute I'm not the God I'm just a God and to make Jesus a God then creates polytheism the Bible never teaches polytheism. Further, those who mistranslate this verse have no problem with verses 2 and 3, which state the word was in the beginning and that the, word was, that the world was made, uh, or, uh, and that the word made all things. As we read in Genesis 1, verse 1, the one who was in the beginning and created the heavens and the earth was God. So either Jesus is God or he is not God. You can't have it both ways. He cannot have been in the beginning and involved in creation and be a God, little g, without making God a little g, God, because they are one. What about the Holy Spirit then? Can we, we can put HS down here in this other circle. We can use also Genesis 1, verse 2, that the Spirit was in the beginning and involved in the creation as well. Look at Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Well, we see that in the beginning, the Spirit also involved in the creation. And if he's involved in the creation, then he must be part of this Spirit entity that is God, not a separate God, but part of the God. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. 
This was Ananias and Sapphira when they lied uh, about a certain amount of money they'd given to the apostles. It says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Ananias' lie was an attempt to deceive not just the apostles, but the whole church. And as such, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, but also it resides in the whole church. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, saying, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And for this reason, Ananias was lying to the Holy Spirit. But then Luke records Peter saying Ananias had lied to God, showing that the Holy Spirit is God. When you lie to one, you lie to the other. They're one and the same. And so we see that God is the Father. He is the Son. He is the Holy Spirit. Well, however, let's look at these three personalities now and see that what each is not. We'll look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, When he had been baptized, and speaking of Jesus, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here we see three very distinct personalities. We have Jesus being baptized. We have the Holy Spirit described as being like a dove. And we have a voice from heaven. In this verse, we see that Jesus, while God, is not Father. Nor is the Father, who is God, Jesus. The same then can also be said of the other two personalities of the Godhead, or the other personality, that the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, nor is the Holy Spirit Jesus, or Jesus the Holy Spirit. And yet there is still a oneness, a connection of the three in spirit, as all three are God, or rather God is all three. In John chapter 14, in verse 16, Jesus said, in referring to the Holy Spirit, and I will pray the Father, so here's Jesus, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. And now Jesus is speaking in reference to his departure, and this is another verse indicating that Jesus is not again returning to earth. So the idea of an earthly kingdom also is a false one. But that word another, meaning of the same sort. And Paul uses the same word in speaking to the Galatians and warning of a different gospel, as we mentioned a moment ago, which is not another, Galatians 6, verse 7. Paul is saying that it is not another like the one he preached. In other words, it was different. And here we see that the Holy Spirit is of the same sort, the same essence as Jesus, but they're not one and the same. They're each of the same essence for spirit, though. Well, how about Hebrews 1? In verse 5, Hebrews 1, verse 5, we read, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And here we see that the father and the son are not the same personality, although they are the same essence. Hebrews relates to 2 Samuel 7, and verse 14, which reads, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. This is one of the verses that we, we look to that has a dual meaning. There, there is a, a direct uh, fulfillment in the Old Testament, but there is a remote fulfillment that is only uh, possible in Jesus, Jesus being a fuller fulfillment of what was said in the past. And so this verse, with its dual meaning, is partly it speaks of David, but it's looking forward to the Messiah. Further reading says, But my mercy shall not depart from him, 
and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Other passages help us to see that this is only Jesus who God speaks of. Acts chapter 2, one of the arguments the disciples made was that David was dead and buried in the tomb. You could go to his tomb, you could see him. He was dead. We see that you know, his kingdom didn't last forever. In fact, after David and after Solomon, then the kingdom was divided. And so this kingdom didn't last forever. Also, John chapter 15 and verse 26, Jesus speaks of the Father sending the Helper, also called the Comforter or the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 and verse 19, also listing all three who we are to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are equal because they are one. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, Paul offering the grace of all three. And so we see three distinct personalities of the one Godhead. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Apologize there, I hit the click one time too many. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Okay, that one was my fault. The mouse slid and bit it. Alright, Matthew 4, verse 10. I apologize. Matthew 4, verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And here Jesus says that only God is to be worshipped and served. Now in Acts 10, verses 25 through 26, uh, we see Cornelius, and he tries to worship the feet of Peter. And Peter tells him, Stand up. I myself am also a man. Uh, a verse the Catholics ought to read. Uh, also in Acts chapter 14, we read of Barnabas and Paul, they're in Lystra, and after healing a man, the people came out, they tried to worship them, and they did not accept the worship of these people. And they said to the people, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from the useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that are in them. Acts 14, verse 15. And of course, Paul was preaching Jesus. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. John, he fell at the feet of the angel to worship him. But the angel said, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And so Jesus said to worship only God. The apostles would not accept worship. An angel said to worship only God while refusing worship. Look with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and we're going to look at verses 51 and 52. Now it came to pass, while well, he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. This is following Jesus' uh, resurrection and subsequent appearances, and he is now ascending. And we see the disciples worshiping Jesus, and no one telling them to do contrary. He doesn't tell them not to. Uh, same when we look to, to Stephen, or, or I'm sorry, Thomas, John 29, verses 27 and 28. Jesus didn't correct Thomas. Thomas, when he addressed him, he calls him, you know, my Lord and my God. See, Thomas realized and Thomas was correct Jesus while not the father is God All right, moving on I uh, put this little uh, analogy of this little chart up here again what we had referred to earlier and we can see the the father the husband the son as I talked about my, the wife the mother uh, the daughter as my daughter said the, the egg and so we see these three parts and then I came across this one I thought was quite interesting, kind of funny. And uh, when I saw it, it was like, ha-ha, that's it. I understand it now. No, but a little bit of the humor here. We see the Kool-Aid man. 
and we see that the Kool-Aid man, you know, he is the jar, he is the liquid, he is the ice, but obviously the ice is not the pitcher, the pitcher is not the, the Kool-Aid or the liquid and so forth. And then it's a little chart as we had with our diagram, the triangle, and we see the, the Kool-Aid man, that he is the liquid, but he is not the, uh, not the pitcher and so on and so forth. So there's your humor for the day. Well, even before we get to the New Testament and speaking of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the Old Testament was preparing us for the unity of God. Right from the very beginning, Genesis 1 and verse 1, using Elohim, as I mentioned earlier, plural and referring to God, the singular verb created. And we see in Genesis 1, 26 through 27, in the creation of man, let us, excuse me, let us make man in our image. Or Genesis 11, verse 7. Come, let us go down and then and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Let's look to Deuteronomy 4, and verse 35. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and verse 35. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. We see this passage affirms without doubt that there is only one God, once again. He was the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, and he is the same God today. In giving the commandments to Israel, God had said, You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 and verse 3. And really he is saying that there are no other gods besides me or apart from me. There, there is no other Elohim. God does not accept other things being called God. And now look at, again, I should have kept this there, Deuteronomy chapter 4. And look at verse 39. Therefore know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Now, some try to argue this verse away by saying that it doesn't mean that there are no, not any other gods. There are just no other gods like him. Well, we can go back to Galatians 1 on that. If, there is not an, if there's not another gospel like the one Paul preached, it, it is to say that there's not, there is no other gospel that saves. And that being the case, they are not gospels then. To say that there is no other gods like the living God of the Bible is to say that there are no other gods. Clearly there is and only is one God. Let's look to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Here in verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And then skip down to verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. While well, some read verse 1 as referring only to the physical nation of Israel, but in truth it, it is the faithful of God through all time. As we learned in a past class, uh, God's children were not those merely by physical descent of Abraham. You can read Galatians on that. Um, but those who walked in God's ways. Uh, that Isaiah writes in the past tense in verse 1 is prophetic. Is all that God says will happen. He and he alone can speak of something in the future as having already happened. Because he, you know, while he doesn't make things happen, you know, we look at things that happen. There's a difference between making something happen and knowing something is going to happen. And that's God knows what's going to happen. And so if we were to read all of this, we would see that Israel was to be God's witness to the nations around them. All they went through and that was recorded is exactly what Jesus was referring to when in John chapter 5 and verse 39 he says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. We also see that God, in doing all he said, he was going to, in reference to Israel, 
is proof that there is only one God. No other alleged God could do what God did. Only God preserved Israel. Only God preserved the lineage to bring about the Savior. And only God is the Savior. Deity come to earth in the flesh. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 to 8. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. What powerful words by God himself that he alone is God. Only he can declare the future before it actually happens. In the same chapter of Isaiah, God tells of the Persian king Cyrus who allowed the Jews to return home and rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple. And at this time, the temple and the wall were built. The Jews inhabited the land. And in the next chapter, in chapter 45, verse 4, God says he is naming Cyrus by name. So when all of this comes to happen, you will know that he is God. He's telling them of Cyrus, the Persian king, 150 years before Cyrus was even born or Persians were even a power. Babylon is the power. Only God can do that. And let us notice some other parts of this that God says. The Lord, the King of Israel. Look with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Well, previously we saw Thomas say to Jesus, my Lord and my God, John 20, verse 28. And while this can be a respectful title, it also means God. Thomas's connection of it with God, obviously in Lord, and showing that he was referring to him as God, not just a polite, well, sir. Peter connects it on the day of Pentecost with Messiah. Speaking of Jesus, obviously he didn't just have a respectful, well, sir, in mind. Over 600 times in the New Testament, Lord is used, most in reference to Jesus. And, and then what about King? Well, look to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come to the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus' question of who told you I was king shows that this is a direct charge against the Jews, you know, a direct charge the Jews laid upon him, which is why Pilate is cornered into doing something later on. Notice Jesus does not deny it, but he speaks of his kingdom. He has a kingdom. He has servants. His kingdom, though, is not of this world. And the fact that he has a kingdom is to say that I am a king. Look to 1 Timothy for me. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. Which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. 
Paul says of Jesus that he is the only potentate, meaning ruler or authority, mighty. It is connected here to king of kings and lord of lords. The only other place we see this is in Revelation 17, verse 14, and in Revelation 19, verse 16. Clear references to Jesus, and thus showing the deity of Jesus and his oneness with God. We see that the Lord, uh, or rather we read that uh, in, in uh, this, uh, excuse me, we read in his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Redeemer, clearly God promised a Redeemer. And Jesus is our Redeemer, having died for us. Revelation 5, verse 9, saying, For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Let us look to Revelation 1. Revelation 1 and verse 11. saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. We see John writing the Revelation, and we see Jesus referred to as the first and the last, also in Revelation 22, verse 13. And then we read, is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Well, look with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. And in verse 6, it says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. Well, now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read in verse 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The rock that Moses miraculously brought forth water from in the wilderness was literal water. But more than that, it was evidence. It is a clear statement of the pre-existence of Christ who gives living water. So we think about first, or I'm sorry, John chapter 4, and starting in verse 10, and Jesus with the woman at the, the Samaritan woman at the well, that he would give living water. And we should not believe that a single rock followed them, but that wherever they went, they were supplied with water, and they all partook of it. And what we see then is that the true giver of water, the true source, uh, is God who is Christ, Christ who is God. And John would apply Isaiah's words to Jesus when he said, these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. When we read John chapter 12 and verse 41, John and Paul both see Christ as preexistent and presiding over the Israelites during their journey. So what we have been seeing is that while there are three distinct personalities of God, that there is only one God. Now, I want us to look at two different words for one. And this is used in the Old Testament, and there's a specific word for one as used in our passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, a little review here. The, the Father is not God exclusive of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son is not exclusive of the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not God exclusive of the Father and of the Son. And while God is each, each is also distinct from one another. We've already seen the teaching of the unity of God in the Old Testament. And, and, and in the 14th century on, uh, the Jews, with some exceptions, have believed in the absolute one regarding God or Jehovah. Now, there is a word here, yakit. It was introduced in the 12th century by a gentleman by the name of Moses Memedes. Uh, not Moses of the Exodus, mind you, but another gentleman uh, who will be introduced. Uh, 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 Moses will we read on as we go later into the, to the Bible. But this Moses, what he did is he changed the Masoretic text. And that's the 24 old manuscripts of the Hebrew and Aramaic uh, texts that make up the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. And he, said, he, he changed this word one. 
Just a little extra info here for you. Tana is actually an acronym. It stands for the three traditional divisions of the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible. Uh, T, Torah or teaching, Ana, uh, Nidin, or prophets, uh, the Ketavim or writings. So the, the, these three make up Tana. And so this Moses Mamedes, though, he changed Akid or Ekad, meaning united one, to Yakid meaning absolute one. And he actually went in and he changed the text. Uh, he was found out, um, though, that it was, he was dishonored for changing God's word, even though there were some who accepted it, um, that it was realized that this was wrong. We, we cannot change God's word. We cannot add to it or take away from it. But let us see what we're talking about here to understand a little better. We're not going to read all these verses, but they're there if you want to try and copy them down. And Akid is a numeral word. It means properly uh, united, one, or first, or like alone, together, only together. Uh, Yakid can also mean properly united, soul, but it also means desolate, solitary, absolutely alone, or just as one. And it appears 12 times in the Old Testament. In Genesis 1, in verse 5, we'll look at that one. It says, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Well, here we see a day, or first, pocket, day. We, we have morning, we have night. Each is distinctive, but it is still one day. Look with me at Exodus 26, or I'm sorry, Exodus, yes, Exodus 26. In Exodus 26 and verse 6. And you shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with the clasps so that it may be one tabernacle. And we see we have various parts in the making of the tabernacle, but there is only one tabernacle. Look at Genesis 22 and we'll look at Genesis 22 verse 6. Here we read, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Here is Yaakov, where we read, they went together, or Yaakov. Obviously, Abraham and Isaac are not one and the same. In fact, Genesis 22, verse 2, we see Yaakov when Abraham is told to take his only son. His son being obviously not himself, but a separate individual. And this is the word improperly used in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, speaking of God, that was changed. Then there, there are three distinct personalities of God, but it is still one God. And while the tabernacle could be taken apart, or Abraham and Isaac could go separate ways, the Spirit of God cannot be separated. And, and so look with me to the Proverbs 4 and verse 3. It says, when I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. Here we're speaking about one individual, and there is only one. And we could go through all these verses, but I, I think those are enough that we see a difference between Yaakid and Akid. And so what we do learn of all this, that there is not three gods. There is one infinite spirit being within that one spirit, there being three dis distinct personalities, Three personalities, but each of these distinct personalities being God. And we may they may be addressed as and called God. Each is actually called Jehovah or God in the Old Testament. Each is capable of loving and being loved by others. Each has a distinct but a separate role to play in the creation of the universe, the creation of man, and the salvation of man. We saw in the creation that God the Father, He is the ultimate authority. We then see, this, we see God, the Son, who is the active agent who actually did the creating. We learn that this is in the New Testament. The Son is the one who did the actual creating. In Genesis 1, we also see God, the Spirit, involved in the creation. And he was perfecting it, if you will. He brought it into completion after it was created. And we consider our salvation. We see that the ultimate authority is the Father, just as in the Old Testament. However, the active agent is the Son, 
the one who actually affected salvation for us? Who is the one that came down to earth and took the form of man? Who is the one who paid the price with his blood upon the cross? And let me ask you, who then is it that perfects us? Which personality of the Godhead helps us in our perfection? And that would be the personality of the Holy Spirit, who has given us the word. We see in Galatians where we develop the fruit of the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who guides certain individuals into giving us the scriptures. It's the Holy Spirit who helps to us come to completion by providing us with God's word that perfects us and it brings us to be mature Christians. It is the word that creates faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. It instructs us in salvation, what to do to be Christ-like. In Deuteronomy 6, in verse 4, we see that Jehovah God is one combined one. One God. One essence of the deity of the three personalities. One showing at one time, one at another time, sometimes two or more. But it is only one united God. And we see that in the Old Testament, the idea of the one united God was clear. The Israelites understood that. For us today, with the additional teachings we have in the New Testament, we can even see it clearer than they did back then. And it's important that we understand this, and we don't make God into three separate gods, that the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit are separated, that they're three different gods. That's polytheism, and it's wrong. Deuteronomy 6.4 makes clear there is only one God. And there are those in the religious world today that are teaching that God is a separate being in heaven and that the sun is another God and, and the earth or who has gone up to heaven, the Holy Spirit is yet a third God. It's, it's wrong. Consider it when God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at once. The idea of a united one means that God is everywhere. And all of him is there. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are not separable. Omniscience requires this, being all-knowing. If it were not so, then the idea of having three gods with them in separate places would say that none of them is omnipresent. And this idea of three gods makes them different and in different places. And if God is not omnipresent, then he's not God. If he's not omnipresent, then he's not omniscient, he's not all-knowing. And because there's a God somewhere doing something separate from him that he doesn't know about. And therefore, he's not God. He can't be all-knowing if he's not all places. Read with me Psalm 139. And we'll be wrapping this up. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, starting in verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines the day, the darkness and the light are both like to you. Proverbs 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And Jeremiah 23, verse 24 says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him? says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? says the Lord. If there are three gods and they are separate, and one can know something that the other two do not. You see how this is wrong? What about omnipotence, all-powerful? If the idea of three gods is correct, then one has, which one has all the power? Which one has the power to act? The one who's here, the one who's on earth, the one who's in heaven, which one? They, can, you know, they can't all act if not all-powerful. If the Father and the Son are absent, they're up in heaven, and they're not omnipresent, they're not omniscient, then the Holy Spirit can do things that they're not aware of, and, and then none are God. If God is not omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and, and does not have unity, then he's not God. The idea of three gods denies the Godhead. And if this is true, and God is not all these things, then everything in the Bible is wrong, 
and not worth reading. But tritheism or polytheism is wrong, and the Godhead of the one God with three personalities is true. The Bible teaches it. History proves it. The Bible is always correct. We need to always turn and look to the pages of the Bible. I have enjoyed this study and appreciated your time. I thank you for being a part of this study. We love you. God bless.